Thank you so much for this very kind introduction. And uh, it is true that we have my wife, Irene, myself, uh, our monks from the monastery have known Lexi and Robert Potemkin and the, the family for many years. And uh, uh, it's really through their kindness and compassion that we have come to know so many people in the States uh, and uh, found support for the, the work that the monks are doing. Um, and uh, you know, many of the important initiatives that His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, has uh, for long you know, advocated and worked hard. So thank you so much. And of course, thank you, Reverend Nicholas. Uh, this is a sacred, very sacred place here. We have been to this place many, many times. Um, and uh, uh, each time we are here, but the reception from the community and the, the, the chapel itself has been very heartwarming and that we always felt very, very welcomed. So thank you so much. And uh, it's a really honor to be here once again. I'm uh, asked to say a little bit about how the work of the monks uh, contribute to the Aspen uh, Valley itself and uh, perhaps to the world at a larger scale. And uh, I would say this, uh, you know, the venerable monks from Deping Lasaling Monastery, they come from a tradition that is uh, rich like many other traditions in the world, you know, the, all the great spiritual traditions, uh, Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, all, they come from a tradition known as Buddhism, and uh, it goes back to 2,500 years or so. Uh, and uh, you know, they are traveling as a way to bring their sacred tradition uh, to the world, to the communities like here, uh, as a way to promote peace and healing. So their tours are actually you know, termed as, or the build as, uh, mystical arts of Tibet tours for uh, global peace and healing. Now, I, I would like to say a little bit about you know, how uh, the monks are doing and then a little bit of the, the underlying principles that how, how important those principles are for today's world. First of all, when the monks travel, as you have experienced right now, you know, um, as they share their sacred chants, creating brief moments for all, all of us to find some peace, some uh, comfort. Uh, that's one of the ways that they do. But also, uh, as uh, Reverend Nicholas mentioned, um, on their tours, they create the mandala sand paintings. Mandala sand paintings, I'm uh, sure many of you have uh, already seen them making here or uh, uh, elsewhere. Uh, these sand paintings are, uh, in a way, uh, representation of the values that we all appreciate: kindness, wisdom. You know that, um, and the, the mandalas represent an enlightened kind of principle, if you will and what unfolds from that. So in a sense, mandala is, as it's translated as center and the surroundings. Mandala is a Sanskrit term, uh, which stands for kilkor in Tibetan, which means kil means center and the surrounding. So it's center represents the central value, like compassion, you know, that forgiveness, or um, a resolute stance uh, to, you know, uh, reconciliation or the uh, uh, resolution of certain conflicts and like that. The mandala that they will be making here, for example, is the mandala of what is known as the Buddha Akshobhya. And the Buddha Akshobhya really is a principle, you know, that it can manifest in the embodied form, uh, but in actuality it is a principle. It is 
an enlightened principle of the quality. Akshobhya, uh, meaning that unshakable. So in that sense, it's the principle that, you know, um, enlightened principle that remains unshakable in the midst of chaos, in the midst of conflict. And in that way, you know, the Buddha Akshobhya represents the reconciliation, the, you know, the transformation of the conflicts and so forth. Uh, and uh, this is something that uh, the, in the Tibetan traditions, it's invoked through arts, through meditations, through rituals. Um, at the times of great uh, conflicts, at the times of great natural uh, disasters, whether the earthquake or the hurricane or the, or the human-made uh, disasters, where a lot of lives are lost. For example, what happened in 2001, 9-11, the tragedies that unfolded in this country. Uh, the venerable monks actually made the mandala of Akshobhya, this particular Buddha, at the advice of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, at, well, at the time what was known as the Sackler Gallery uh, of Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. Um, and uh, for three weeks, they created the mandala as a way to, you know, to contribute to the peace and healing in the aftermath of those tragedies that were whole nation, perhaps the many parts of the, the world, all were shaken by that such horrible tragedies, you know, that and, and uncertainties. So that's where that uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama had recommended the monks to create this mandala. And uh, you know, I remember as yes, I was part of that uh, process, there are uh, thousands and thousands of people that in in the you know, winter that they started at January 11th in 2002, just four months after the, the, the tragedy, uh, you know, 9-11 happened. And, uh, you know, despite snow and, you know, the weather, thousands of people came and then did what the monks did was uh, held each day about 45 minutes of meditation and chants and then the, the you know, the several hours of this working on the mandala sand painting, people came, sat, found uh, the, you know, that really this inner sense of comfort. And, uh, you know, this, uh, these are uh, test testimonies that the Smithsonian had to reg register. It's still, I think, that on their website. Uh, and uh, that's kind of the thing that when, you know, for me, when I see how the monks work, you know, their time here provide a little bit of that, you know, a moment of peace and comfort. It's really, really worthwhile. Uh, and uh, that's what they do. Of course, they, they do travel uh, at times then, uh, you know, offering lectures on different aspects um, of uh, spirituality, uh, different aspects of meditations and like that. So in that way, that their work, um, we hope that in some ways contribute to, uh, towards you know, individual well-being and uh, in, you know, through by extension, perhaps, the communal peace and uh, world peace in some way. As if we, if we think about that, each one of us, as we become you know, inspired as we find some kind of change within our own experience, that does have to create a ripple effect, you know, that because we are living beings, our experience, our thoughts, our attitudes, our feelings, you know, they, they uh, manifest in our expression, facial expressions, in our bodily gestures, in our words, in our actions, and, uh, you know, if I'm agitated, very agitated like that, that, right now that expression will create a certain kind of, you know, uh, disharmonious atmosphere because we are beings that we rest kind of the pick up is this empathy, our mirror neurons, as the scientists say, you know that we pick up what the person next to you, you know, signals through their expression, through 
tone of voice, bodily gestures, and so forth. So therefore, certainly how we feel about has a direct impact on people immediately around us that we interact, our family members, our co-workers, and so forth and so on. So I do believe that you know, the work that monks are doing, work, you know, that it's not just them, you know, everyone, you know, that the way we live, what, the way we experience, it has an impact on beyond us, certainly in our own personal lives, but beyond us as well. So in that way, um, you know, their work is as a way to promote peace and healing, and I hope that the, in some small ways that the community here uh, experiences that. Now, um, you know, the, the monks travel um, also with a certain, um, you know, place of pain and suffering also. Because the Tibet has for the last 60 some years has gone through an, an, an unimaginable, you know, suffering the, uh, you know, in the hands of the communist Chinese, that when the Tibet was occupied by China, you know, communist Chinese in 1950s. And uh, so the leader of Tibet, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who has worked, you know, tirelessly to resolve this issue through peaceful means, through nonviolence, uh, they travel as kind of and ambassadors, informal ambassadors, to bring that message to the world of the peace, but also you know, to need to peacefully resolve the issue so that the, you know, their brothers and sisters uh, in Tibet can uh, have the basic human rights. And this is true after 60 years of occupation. It's only getting worse, you know, that uh, it, 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 you know, perhaps, but they had a most difficult situation now, and uh, there are so many difficulties, so many tragedies in the world, uh, and uh, you know, it's Tibet uh, situation is one of them. And then their hope is to raise awareness about this situation. That the Tibetans, with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, you know, uh, finding asylum, many of them in India. It's one of the things that His Holiness the Dalai Lama has focused right after arriving in India was to preserve their sacred, their culture. And by rebuilding all the important institutions, whether it's the spiritual institutions like the monasteries that for Tibet, these are the kind of the, you know, they like the Harvard and Princeton. You know, this, and these are major uh, learning centers in Tibet, their monastery had like over 10,000 monks in training you know, in 1959. Uh, and uh, so these institutions are reestablished in India along with all other uh, institutions, whether it's the performing arts or the institution for medicine, you know, the Tibetan medicine and astrology and so forth. Uh, and, uh, you know, thanks to that effort that it, the in exile, the culture, the spirituality is to some, some extent intact and uh, you know, uh, flourishing. But of course, you know, it's a continuous struggle being in the uh, uh, you know, refugee uh, situation you know, that for the, the funding and so forth. So that's why they travel as a, also a way to raise uh, funds for the ever-growing uh, monks uh, in their uh, monastery, you know, the monastery that when it was established, re-established in South India in 1969, it, uh, of that original 10,000 or so monks, only 216 were there to rebuild uh, in South India. And today, you know, the monastery population is about 3,000 or so. So, you know, that uh, it, it, it's a constant uh, need, the financial need. Is a constant need, and uh, so that's what they travel. And the, you know, the, our dear sister, <coughs> let's see, and our brother Robert, and they, they've really supported the monastery for so long, and we are very grateful for that. Let me say a little bit about, you know, 
the tradition that they, they uh, bring, not as the kind of substitute for what you have, what the world has, you know, that there's a rich spiritual tradition, the rich humanistic, you know, values, you know, in all societies of all America, of course, you know, grounded in very, very, you know, fundamental and very important principles of the, you know, the, the it's enshrined in the Constitution that is, uh, that's why that America has so long has been the beacon for, you know, hope and liberty and freedom. Um, so it's not no way as a kind of the substitute or anything like that. But the, the monks, you know, bring something in from their tradition that may be helpful, that may, you know, go together, particularly with the, uh, you know, growing scientific uh, understanding about our, our human condition, you know, about how we can promote our health and mental health, emotional health, well-being. So in these times, perhaps the message that they bring may be really uh, helpful, uh, and it is evident from the fact that a growing you know, number of scientists, health care uh, professionals, educators themselves, you know, many of them are finding the message that they're being kind of resonating with them. We live in a world, I mean, that way to it, it's all too obvious to all of us that how, uh, you know, the growing kind of divide across, you know, uh, racial, across, uh, you know, religious and, you know, uh, across political ideologies and so forth. We, we are living in a world, you know, it, it's, it's growing. And then the, the pace of the, you know, information that can spread, uh, like the social media, the news, and the medium for that dissemination of the, the news, you know, that how the social media works in the, the algorithm, you know, it's kind of guiding what kind of information, you know, it gets fed into my little gadget, you know, that I think that we can see that how, you know, important it is for us to find a way to really um, create this sense of what His Holiness the Dalai Lama calls the oneness of humanity. You know, that uh, there's a beautiful book written by Lexi, you know, Know uh, Yourself. It's, it's incredible. I was just, you know, uh, I, I had read uh, previously, but this morning I was just reading also. One of the things that just right in the beginning that, that, that is, uh, struck me so deeply, that Lexi says that, you know, she, for, to write this book, uh, it's about, f uh, for her, you know, that it's her approach that is what she calls the, the, the new term. I think it is new term, the coined the new term. I think we need to use that. Uh, it's enthusiastic, enthusiastic. That meaning that the risk, you know, that embracing many traditions, you know, that in, through which we can find compassion for each other, respect for each other. You know, that the world is a rich place in many ways. That there's, you know, for millennia, people in all societies have explored how to make our lives better, how to make our societies better. So therefore, they say a wisdom in all traditions. And if we are open to, you know, if we are, if we have that kind of spirit of embracing, you know, that many uh, views, many, you know, th th seeing the, the wisdom, the understanding insights from, from children to leaders, to, from priests, you know, to teachers and like that, I think that we can really, um, you know, navigate our lives even most tumultuous of our times that we are. Uh, so, message of compassion that the monks bring, you know, that it's an absolutely necessity, you know, that many uh, thinkers are saying that, com like His Holiness the Dalai Lama says, that compassion, love and compassion are necessities, not mere luxuries. 
Without them, humanity cannot survive. Without compassion, can we really survive? Think about this. You know, compassion not is some kind of nice feeling that you know, I become a doormat and that nice. And if somebody is doing bad thing and I say that, oh, you know, I forgive you. I want your peace and let them, you know, uh, abuse you. Not like that. Compassion comes from a very deep, courageous place. You know, the, where we can understand, we can f connect with the other with a certain sense of identification, certain sense of commonality. You know, that seeing how other person is just like me in the sense that we both want to be safe, to be happy, to be free from suffering. If we can connect somebody with that deep fundamental aspiration, the dream and goal, then that is true of all human beings and animals included, you know, like that. Beautiful thing for us today is that science is, you know, uh, demonstrating that studies through the studies, there are, you know, the many studies uh, that show how little children, that, you know, three months old baby, five months old, eight months old babies, clearly demonstrate their deep predisposition for the preference for those who are nice, who are kinder, you know, as opposed to who is uh, cruel. It makes sense, it's a common sense, you know, that uh, it, it certainly is our personal experience too, you know, that somebody who is cruel to us, would, would we feel good about them? Would we want to be around them? Or would we want to be around someone who is kind, who is understanding, you know, like that? You may not be familiar, I might, might be kind of the, uh, preaching to the choir here, but, uh, but I think it makes, uh, you know, it's important for us to remind ourselves that, you know, when it comes to our well-being, if you think about how important this sense of bonding how important that the kindness, compassion really is, you know, like that since, ever since 1950s, like the one John Bald, Bald, um, yeah, Bald B, you know, that British uh, psychiatrist created this uh, research uh, in which he emphasized the importance of the attachment, meaning bonding between the mother and the child as it's extended, you know, certainly to father and the child, or the, the you know, substitute mother, or the, whoever is the crucial caregiver, attachment figure. That is what kind of lays the foundation of how we grow, how we feel, having a secure base, you know, that from which we can explore. If we don't have the secure base at our own, you know, home as growing, as children, that we end up, you know, that uh, in, uh, insecure, in which our own mental capacity bandwidth shrinks because, the, of go, after all, survival is important, and it goes to, you know, it shrinks to, and then we we're not able to have that, the cognitive kind of space to explore, to learn, to understand, to connect, and so forth. So, you know. The adverse childhood experiences, you know, these growing uh, studies uh, today, it shows that how early adversities for children in our societies, you know, that how they impact the children's lifelong journey, you know, that making more susceptible for illnesses, you know, that unable to, to making difficulties to connect with others, how are we going to find you know, a joy, a sense of comfort and fulfillment in life if the very person that we are living as a spouse or the you know, children or the brother, sister, you know, if, there is, is the, if we are unable to connect meaningfully, how would that a home be a, a place of that 
security and comfort and the growth. How would a school, a classroom, the where the teacher, the students, the administrators, you know, if they fail to create a more compassionate classroom, where the children come and then they feel unsafe, that they feel not understood, they feel excluded, unable to connect. How, how a child can learn in this kind of situation? You know, so you can see that compassion, you know, not as a religious value, a basic human value, perhaps not even basic human, mammalian value, mammals, you know, that all have this biological disposition, a given disposition to, you know, sense the other's needs around and to be able to respond, you know, like it's narrow. But in today's world, in this very kind of shrinking world where the global, you know, connection is such that any given place, we are, you know, place is represented by many different traditions, different backgrounds, different, you know, uh, preferences, so forth. So in such diversity, how can we respect that diversity while pulling us apart? How can we, you know, maintain that? Kindness to compassion is a way to go, and that's why that compassion is as basic as clean water for us, as you know, clean air for us, without which society really uh, is affected. And this is becoming clear in the healthcare profession, in the business world, in the leadership. There's a growing you know, awareness about that. And this work, I think, you know, among many great thinkers you know, for many decades, His Holiness the Dalai Lama has made also a significant contribution, you know, that his own approach to this kind of inclusiveness, you know, enthusiastic kind of spirit that he brings, you know, that his focus in life, yeah, you know, he presents in as four focuses in life. Number one, he said that as one of the citizens of this world, one as a, one of the seven plus billion human beings in this world. His number one commitment is the well-being of the people, world, by promoting basic human values. Basic human values, like kindness, compassion, you know, more uh, kind of emotional skills, you know, the, the empathy and the, you know, forgiveness, and just the respect for each other. These are the kind of the, the, the values that he sees are so important for our well-being because we have a tremendous kind of this, the talent, the skill uh, in the world, you know, America certainly, to make the, the, the external um, environment very, very you know, convenient and comfortable and, you know, helpful for our well-being and like that. But the amount or the kind of the degree of struggle that we are seeing in this country itself, you know, mental health. Why can you imagine that, you know, at age, 12, 13, 14, you know, the adolescents growing. It's a time for them to explore, play, learn, you know, succumb to depression, anxiety, you know, that, and it, it, at times, you know, even ending life and like that. What does that tell? You know, that what is, what is missing here? The financial or the material progress very, it's very important, absolutely. But if we neglect the inner values, these inner skills, no amount of external progress will deliver, facilitate a more meaningful, happy, 
harmonious you know, life for individuals or the society. So that's why, again, not as the substitute to the material development, but together to complement inner values, you know, promoting inner values, like kindness and compassion, have more of the, the way to regulate our emotions, to develop more of how we can have a meaningful connection and the meaning and purpose in life. You know, these are things that uh, all spiritual traditions uh, have valued, and the, the Buddhist tradition is not an exception. And uh, thanks to the leader in His Holiness, Shiva in His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, you know, his tireless work with the scientists, with the healthcare professionals, and you know, people from all walks of life, he has, you know, uh, kind of uh, inspired and uh, a, a really uh, a, a growing collaboration between scientists and the contemplative uh, scholars and like that. That's what the, you know, Alexi was mentioning earlier. I think that you know, the, in, in the, when you see this work, I, I'm, I'm reminded of another, you know, uh, the the saying that. Like the Austin says, and that is that uh, you know the demise of the values would be the demise of the society. You know that uh, I think that is you can see how in a family, if we can't build trust and kindness among each other, cooperation, how would that family really, you know, sustain a harmonious environment? That's true for the society, true for an organization, true for the world. So I think that that's why, you know, uh, when the monks travel, of course, that you know, at times that with the limitation in language, uh, you know, they may not be able to convey these uh, messages, you know, themselves. But they convey by embodying them. You know, there are many people that who have had the opportunity to be around them, you know, uh, do uh, get a sense of, you know what it is about, how it, you know, the, a, a certain kind of, you know, change of feeling because we can pick up, not in a kind of the mysterious ways, <laughs> the grounded in our biology and the neuroscience through the mirror neurons that we pick up from each other. And I think that, the, you know, through the embodying that and then through their work and so forth, they do make a huge con contribution, you know, uh, Notwithstanding that, you know, through them bringing this awareness of the importance of the work that is happening, um, you know, uh, under the guidance of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, for example, at Emory University, we have a center, Center for Contemplative Science and Compassion-Based Ethics, you know, that we have for the last 20 years or so collaborated with His Holiness the Dalai Lama to bring modern science to the Tibetan monasteries and nunneries. And now it's part of the kind of curriculum, you know, the, the core curriculum in those monasteries, to equip them with the scientific thinking, scientific knowledge, scientific methodologies, so that they can collaborate with the scientists to do studies and like that. And it's already happening that, you know, producing kind of um, the, the uh, doing research and creating articles and like that. You know, a growing uh, awareness research in the field of compassion. You know, it's, it's uh, for healthcare or the uh, general public, for foster care uh, community, for people struggling with different health issues like the, first, uh, the breast cancer survivors, the suicide survivors, the veterans, and so forth. Uh, we have done a number of studies with them that how just introducing compassion, not as a religion, just the basic human values, ways to cultivate that, you know, those uh, way to cultivate that compassion is something that for millennia, you know, their tradition has kind of specialized and then bringing those, you know, uh, uh, it's growing. And then, then as Leslie mentioned, you know, the, our, the most recent program in social, emotional, and ethical learning, what we call the C learning, you know, bringing this basic kind of skills, of emotional skills, social skills, systems thinking, you know, how to, in the schools from K through 12, and it is going globally 
and the, their work you know, by interacting, by inspiring you know, people like Zane like Robert and many of you or to many others around you know, uh, help draw attention to this meaningful work that is happening and we hope that uh, you know, in whatever small ways that this can um, be implemented, introduced in different settings, I think that um, it can make some meaningful contribution. Not overnight, but uh, in the long run, I think that their work uh, is a meaningful contribution and uh, uh, you know, it's with that, those purposes that travel. Thank you so much. Thank you.